If you're lonely, longing for someone to hear you If your burdens feel like more than you can bear If you're searching for a place to just be honest Come just as you are If you're tired of just hoping for an answer If you're wishing you could let your God come down If you feel like you can hold it all together Come just as you are Hi! I'm really glad that you've joined us for another Sunday's Word. What a joy it is to come to you Sunday after Sunday, believing that the Word of Christ will dwell in your hearts richly. That's our prayer before every broadcast, that the Word of God will be planted in your heart to produce the harvest, the fruit of Jesus Christ in the world in which we live. So today I want to introduce to you a leader from our South Central region. He serves the Arcadia Church and Pastor Danny Hurlbert as assistant pastor, youth leader, groundskeeper of the church, and sound technician. <laughs> wow, he's got a lot of work to do. But today, he's taken time to open the word of the Lord to us. His name is Joel Reyes. His friends call him Joey, and he's married to Brandy Reyes, who serves as the regional youth director for the South Central region. Together, they have three children, Jackson, Ella, and Evelyn. And I'm sure he is new to many of you, but I am also sure that you will be enriched by the word of the Lord he brings to this broadcast today. In fact, as I thought about what it was that he was going to share, I thought about what James said when he wrote, Receive with meekness the implanted word, watch this, which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man that beholds himself in a glass and he goes away and he immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Verse 25 says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man will be blessed in what he does. <laughs> so today, my prayer is that you will receive with meekness the implanted word. It's much like the story that we call the parable of the sower, when in reality, it's not really about the sower as much as it is about the soil. So when we receive with meekness the implanted word of the Lord, that seed begins to germinate and it produces life and fruit from that life that is 
enriching to those who see it. Today, Joey will be ministering from Jeremiah, the prophet, chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. And this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. And the Bible clearly says that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. <laughs> I'm praying again that the word of the Lord will come to you. Just like the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And this is the word that Jeremiah received before Jeremiah was formed by God. God said, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. But then you know the story. Jeremiah then began to raise obstacles or issues that he thinks might be difficult for God to use him because he doesn't have the ability to speak like he might be expected to speak. But oh, God knows us. He formed us. And so today, as Joey raises to us the fullness that you and how God knows and needs you to embrace this word or receive this word so that the word of the Lord will be illustrated in life through the relationships that you have. So may your listening to the word motivate your hearing so that action as a doer of the word occurs. Blessings on you today as you receive the word of the Lord with meekness. Good evening, America and abroad. It's that wonderful, joyous time again, and it's just us and the Word of God. Uh, tonight, as, uh, as Bishop Gillum has probably already uh, introduced, um, I am Joey Reyes, and I'm coming to you from beautiful Arcadia, Florida. Uh, tonight, the message is going to be about you. Isn't that amazing? It's going to be about you and how God wants to use you and that He already knows you. Amen. So as we begin this, uh, this word, it might be a little bit different than what others have done in time past. But for me, I know that God has given it to me to share to you all. And it's going to be about three different people that I have come in contact with throughout this week. Uh, my job entails uh, air conditioning work. And so I see a lot of different people every single day. And unfortunately, I see them in their time of need. You know, uh, they wouldn't be calling us if they didn't need some type of AC work. Uh, but at the same time uh, that I'm there, I finish my AC work and then I um, talk to them about Jesus. What a... what? There's, there's no better way to, to end the time with them than to talk about Jesus. Now, there have been some folk that I have spoke with that I have been able to uh, invite to church. Uh, some of them just kind of blow you off and uh, they don't, they're really not interested. Okay, I understand. I'm not going to push them, but at the same time, I have planted that seed of Jesus Christ in their life. And I'm thankful for that opportunity. Uh, so like I said, tonight I'm going to be talking about three different people. Uh, for privacy, um, for the sake of their privacy, I'm only going to use uh, one letter from their name. So the first person I'm going to be talking about tonight is Mr. B. And now Mr. B, uh, I've only met this man two different times. The first time he was a pretty happy guy. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty happy guy myself. 
so we uh, we hit it off pretty good and um, he uh, he always likes to give bottles of water or anything to drink sweet tea uh, lemonade He's like, whatever you want, I've got it. And I said, well, I sure do appreciate it, just as long as it's not alcohol. I'll be all right. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, he said, I don't drink. And I said, well, that's good. Now, the first time everything went well, uh, I got his AC unit back up and running, no big deal. The second time they called me, it was probably about three weeks, three weeks later, which is now this present week that we are currently in now. And... <laughs> I was in the middle of working on their unit, a, a totally different problem than the first time. And he come out with a bottle of water and he was crying, bawling his eyes out. I mean, he could, I could barely, mm, I could recognize him, but his face was just swollen, swollen uh, from crying so much. And I said, hey, I said, uh, what's wrong? Is everything okay? And he said, Honestly, he said, no. He said, I need a new head. And I said, oh my, I said, that don't sound too good, buddy. And he said, no. He said, I, I just woke up from a, from a horrible seizure. Now, I didn't, I didn't know this, that he had seizures. And uh, probably about, I don't know, a minute later, uh, he walks inside and his dad come out around the corner and uh, he said, yeah, he said he, he suffers from seizures and he's been he's been, you know, battling it for the past like 20, 30 years. And I said, wow, I said, that's, you know, that's remarkable that that somebody, you know, has not yet, you know, gone and sought any kind of treatment. He just deals with it. You know, he's not on any type of medication for it. And um, so I good news. I got the race unit back up and running and uh I went inside and I said, you know what? I said, uh, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, oh man. He said, I absolutely do. And I said, well, great, give me your hands. And so I took his hands and I just, I closed my eyes and I began to pray for this man's healing. Now, mind you, this man, he's in his mid forties. And as soon as I start to pray, he begins to cry and bawl like uncontrollably. And when, when I was praying for him, everything around me went blank. I couldn't hear anything. I was just praying. And I, I could feel, I could feel him kind of come closer. And then he just began to wrap his arms around me, you know, like a big giant bear hug. And um, it truly was an amazing experience. Uh, I could definitely feel God's presence. Uh, it got so hot so fast uh, he began to shake uncontrollably now I there was not for a second that I had any doubt that God wasn't healing this man and I didn't I did not once believe that he was having a seizure shaking there in my arms while I was praying for him and as I was finishing up my prayer um, I, I heard somebody walk through the door and his dad lives in a different house, totally different building. And uh, he was bringing me the check for the bill. And he said, what's going on? And I said, well, sir, I was praying for your son. He told me he needed a new head. And he said, he's tired of fighting these seizures. And so I prayed for his healing. And he said, I knew something was going on. Because he said, as soon as I walked out of my house, now mind you, they're two separate buildings. And he, and it's, you know, it, he had to walk from one building to another to get to the second house. He said, as soon as he walked out of the door of his own house, the hair on the back of his neck and all across his body began to stand up and he was feeling goosebumps and he didn't know what was going on. Only until the time he walked through the door and he asked me what is going on. Now I prayed for this man and I told him, I said, now I understand that it's a struggle. I understand that there's going to be hard times. 
I said, but from this day forward, you have to walk in agreement with my faith and with your faith and with the help of Jesus Christ that your body and that your mind would be healed. And his answer was, I will. I will. Now, this was, uh, what day was this? Tuesday. Tuesday. Now, Tuesday, Hurricane or Tropical Storm Elsa, whatever you want to call her, uh, was supposed to be uh, making an impact here in Southwest Florida. I did not want to go to work. <laughs> that was the last thing on my mind, right? I got, I've got God's property here to take care of. It's five acres. I believe God's property comes first before uh, my secular job. That's just how important I view it. But I had to go to work instead. Now, Once I prayed for this man, the only thing I could think of was, thank you, God. Thank you for bringing me to work today. If I did not go to work, I never would have met that man for the second time, and I never would have got to pray for his healing. Sometimes we have to do things that we don't want to do. And somewhere throughout the day, God will change it. Now, from that point on to the rest of my day, it was like a complete 360. Now, mind you, I was a little aggravated. I didn't want to go to work. But the Lord used me in that instance to change my entire day. But not only to change my day, but to change that man's life, Mr. B's life. And from this day on, from that day on, his life would forever be changed. And I 100% wholeheartedly believe it. Now the second person I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Him and his wife. Mr. and Mrs. R. This was just yesterday. Now Mr. R. Unfortunately, his wife told me that he's in prison. Now, him and his wife, they were going to church pretty regularly. And uh, he got mixed up with, with some things and with the wrong crowd. And what his wife shared with me was that they basically threw him under the bus, blamed him for everything, and he took the fall. Unfortunately, th sometimes those things happen. But he was hanging out with the wrong crowd, the wrong crowd that he shouldn't have been hanging around with. But his wife shared with me that throughout this entire time of him being in prison, even before prison, that their faith, their faith was a little wavering. You know, they thought, oh my goodness, you know, we, we're in church, we're serving God. But just that one time, that one time of, of hanging out with old friends. And then look where it got him. Now, Mr. R and his wife, they were completely, you know, at a loss. They basically lost everything. Uh, the, his wife has continued serving God. And so is Mr. R. He's in prison serving God. Because he, he told his wife, he said, you know, he said, I might be in prison. But how many people in the Bible were put in prison too? They might have, they might not have been hanging around with the wrong, with the right people. They got put into prison. So he's using this, this bad time of him being in prison to share the good news of Jesus Christ. He's sharing the gospel with all these other inmates. He's, his wife told me, he said uh, that no matter, no matter what circumstance they're in, God gets all the glory. If, if we don't do it as servants of Christ, as children of God, somebody else will. 
It is our job. It is our duty to praise God always, to praise him whether we're in the valley or whether we're on top of that mountain. We need to praise him anyway. Now, again, I was I met these folks or I met his wife and children uh, doing AC work. And. Uh, it is a beautiful thing to to hear testimonies, to be able to witness to people, to be able to share the good news of Jesus. And this lady, she told me, she said, well, we've been going to this church, going to that church. And she said, we just haven't found one that felt like home. So what did I do? <laughs> I gave her the address and I said, well, we start at 1045 Sunday morning. I said, we'd be glad to have you. And so I invited her to our church. Whether she comes or not, we'll see. But my faith is still in Jesus, whether she comes or whether she does not. Either way, she knows. She knows where she needs to be. They know as a family that the prison sentence isn't going to be much longer and that they're still using it for his kingdom and for his glory. Now the third man I want to talk to you about tonight. This one is a, is a pretty miraculous one. His name is Mr. R. Now Mr. R, I had the joyous pleasure of doing uh, an installation on his house, a split unit. And I, I asked him a couple questions because uh, he had mentioned some things about God. And so if people are going to start talking about God, then so am I. I seen some, you know, some, uh, some scriptures on the wall. And so I started talking to him about it. And I said, oh, you guys go to church and all this good stuff, you know, and just small talk. But that's how it starts. And so he said, oh, yeah, man. He said, we've been going to church for a long time. He said, we're. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're members in the church and all this good stuff. And I said, oh man, that's awesome. That's great. And, uh, and he said, you know, he said, uh, I'd be lost without God. And he said, oh, and I said, oh man, me too. I said, where we once were to now where we are now. Oh man, it's definitely old and new, right? The old man is gone. Now we put on the newness. But he began to share with me his life story. And this was probably, I think he said like five, six years ago. This man, Mr. R, he said he was working, working same job he has now. Very, very uh, good job, very steady job throughout the entire state from coast to coast. I'm pretty sure from Key West to Georgia Line. Uh, but it's a family business. His dad started it long, many years ago, and he's, you know, kind of taken everything over. Well, during that time, he uh, began to get very, very stressed. Now, I know stress is very, very uh, hard to deal with, especially if it's your everyday life and it's your it's your job. It's what it's what comes with the territory. You know, that's just. That's just the way it is. So we become accustomed to it. But let me tell you, God does not want you to be stressed. It's not worth it. It will literally kill you. It's not healthy. But Mr. R, he told me, he said, I, he said, I was under a whole lot of stress. He said every day, day in, day out. He just didn't seem like he could go another day. Well, it finally caught up to him. He said one day he was out working and he said it got the best of him. He said he was just, he just laid flat out. Well, they had to, they had to airlift him to a big hospital. I'm not sure where, somewhere here in Florida. And his, his insides had, had ruptured. Um, they had to take apart a lot of his colon um, his heart was starting to, to shut down. 
His arteries were weren't were in bad shape, and he seemed seems to be a pretty healthy guy. But it was everyday life. It was the everyday struggles that were just eating him up. They were they were getting the best of him, and uh, it finally took a toll on his body, and his body just had enough. And so, in between, from where he was at to that hospital, he told me he said I died. I died for under two minutes. He said it was less than two minutes that he died for. He said, I don't know if you believe in when people die that they see heaven. And I said, well, personally, I can't say that I've encountered it myself, but I know people that have, and they speak of it. And everything that they speak of is real. Everything that they speak of lines up with the word of God. Now, he told me, he said that God spoke to him. And he said, it's not your time, son. It's not your time. You still have work to do in this earth. And that work is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And at the same time, he said the Lord showed him just, just a small glimpse of, of two small, very, very small little individuals. And he said it was just a quick, quick flash, but he said, it stayed with him. And he said it was two small little girls. He said, I didn't think anything of it. He has a wife and one daughter. And so after that, he said, everything, everything come back. He said, somebody was on top of him with the shocking paddles. There was a doctor to his left, a doctor to his right, a doctor on top of him, a do two doctors at his feet. He said there was everybody everywhere. He said I was in the hospital. And at this point, I'm, I mean, I'm bawling my eyes out. I just, I can't contain it, you know, uh, because when the Lord just, when the Lord uses a testimony and it touches your life, there's nothing else that you can do. Especially if, you, if you're receptive, if you're attentive to what is being said, attentive to what is going on. You know, when, when the Lord's presence comes around, the only thing I can do is bow. That's all I can do. Hide my face and just bow before him and cry and wail and just thank God. That's all I can do. Anyway, long story short, um, he gets out of the hospital uh, a month and a half later. Uh, he, he's at home doing some home health, uh, a rehab nurse coming every other day uh, to make sure everything's going as planned and then make sure he's still uh, alive and well. And so he didn't know, but his wife, who was married just two years prior to this incident happening, happening his wife and his son-in-law were trying to have children. They didn't tell anybody, but they were doing IVF, uh, IUI, all those, uh, all those uh, artificial processes. And they all failed, and they all failed, and they all failed time and time after again, time and time after again. And he said he was sitting, sitting in the recliner, and he said his daughter ran through the door, ran through the door. And she wrote a little note, showed him a picture and said, dad, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant with two children, two. Now the only thing they knew is that they were pregnant with two children. And folks, I tell you, he couldn't contain it. And this was, the girls are now four, fixing to turn five. And so 
he said, okay. He already knew what was going on, but he didn't tell nobody. So he said, listen, he said, I know what's happening. So I need you to take me to every ultrasound, you know, every, every progression ultrasound until they figure out uh, what the girls, or I'm sorry, I'm giving it away, <laughs> what, chil what the children are going to be, what genders they are. And um, so I think it was about, I don't know, 18, 19, 20 weeks, something like that. Um, they have this ultrasound done. And the doctor said, you're having two baby girls, two twin baby girls. Now, at this point, you know, he, he had all this stuff in his dream written down and he finally shared it with his family after, after they had found out that they were going to have two twin girls. And he said, you know, he said, I had this dream that whenever I died, God spoke to him that, that there was going to be two little girls in my life and that they were going to change my life. And that that was a part of the reason that God was keeping me alive. But he had no idea. So when we serve God, when we're attentive, when we listen to what God is telling us, when we hear what he's trying to say, As long as we stay faithful to him, as long as we stay on the straight and narrow path, everything is going to be all right. Now, wherever you are tonight, whatever you're doing, whether you're in the car, whether you're sitting down on the kitchen table, whether you're behind the computer screen, whether you're scrolling through Facebook and it's just playing in the background. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, God truly loves you. God wants to use you. You might think, wow, I haven't been saved for very long. I've only been saved for a month. Maybe you're just now going to church. Maybe this is your first time. Maybe you've been in church for the past 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, whatever the case may be, whether you're a minister like myself or whether you're a worship leader or whether you're a youth leader or whether you're a senior pastor, whatever the case might be, church, congregation, young child, elderly person. I speak to each and every single one of you to tell you that wherever you are in your situation, no matter how big, no matter how small, God wants to use you. God still has a plan for your life. Church, I cannot, I cannot stress it enough. It truly is an amazing thing to hear testimonies. It, I mean, it's, it's life changing. And so that's why, you know, I, I had a whole different message planned out before I encountered these people. And then I encountered these three people and I thought, my goodness, that's so powerful. I got to share this with the world, a continuation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe you've forgotten about God and try to do things on your own way. Maybe you thought he doesn't know who I am. Maybe you thought, why am I serving God? Well, I got some scripture for you. If you have your Bibles tonight, it's in the book of Jeremiah. We're starting in verse four. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, right? Maybe you don't believe that. 
but explain explain to me how God knew that Mr. R's daughter was going to have two twin girls. How? Why? Because God formed us in the belly. And before that, he knew us. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Maybe you think that you're young and you don't have a voice. I'm here to tell you, God is your voice. He is your mouthpiece. He will give you the words to say. And then here it is. Verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. He tells you to say it not. Don't say that you're a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Verse 8, Be not afraid of their faces. Don't be intimidated. No matter how big, no matter how small man might be, guess what? God is bigger. Amen. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then this just sums it up. It, 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 he puts his seal of approval on it. Then, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Amazing. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words into thy mouth. So next time that you're thinking that I'm a child, I don't know the words to say, Read over these scriptures. Write it down. Now for me, I was in the military. And, you know, in the military, they have that old army recruiting sign where Uncle Sam is pointing his finger. He's pointing at you. And he says, I want you. Well, guess what, church? God wants you more. Now, I have to share this before before I bring this to a close. Um, I think it's probably about a year and a half now. I was, I was mid-sleep, and God woke me up from a deep sleep. And when I woke up, I was shaking. I was scared. It scared me to death. And I woke up in a sweat. And my wife, it scared my wife to death because she was sleeping too. And I said, honey, God gave me something. And she said, well, write it down. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and share with you a little bit about state convention for 2021. I know it looks different this year. You know, we've been through a long time of uh, difficulties and changes. And as you know, uh, uh, probably uh, when we have to make decisions about conventions and so forth, there's a long timeline with contract commitments and so forth. And back much earlier in the year, even into last year, when some of these decisions were having to be made, there was such uncertainty that this is what the, uh, uh, the state bishop and the regional and the district bishops uh, came up with. And so, so State Convention 21 does look differently. Uh, on September 3 through 5, pastors and the state ministry team, along with their companions, will gather for a time of equipping and worship. There will be training in the daytime and worship and sharing of the word in the evenings. Now, the evening messages and worship and so forth will be live streamed so that our, our, our membership can participate. Yes, I know it's live stream participation, but uh, we still want you to be a part of that. 
Uh, we will be streaming to our app, our uh, Florida COGOP app. So if you haven't downloaded that, you're going to want to do that soon. Uh, our worship will be directed by Sister Aretha Cayley, along with the convention worship team, uh, and that's on the live stream as well. Uh, the Friday evening message, uh, which will have a student ministries focus, will be uh, brought to us by Sister Palma Hutchinson. Uh, and then the uh, Saturday evening uh, message will be brought by Bishop Tim Coulter, who is our General Presbyter of North America. And then on the Sunday, which will actually be a morning, but the Sunday morning message will be brought uh, by our state bishop, uh, Bishop Scott Gillum. Uh, so you're going to want to join us uh, again live stream it means you can do it with us live but it will be available after so you can view it uh, at, you know when it's convenient for you um, you know one of the wonderful things about convention time is that we get to fellowship we get to see those that we maybe haven't seen in whatever a couple of years or something like that so in an effort to try to um, you know, allow us to still be able to experience that. Uh, the regional bishops and their teams are, are going to be hosting uh, regional celebrations, and you will be able to see those dates uh, listed here in this post. And you're going to want to participate because they are just that, a time of uh, celebration and fellowship and, and being thankful for what the Lord has done and how he's brought us through. So we look forward to your participation through the live stream. And then, of course, again, at the regional celebrations when we come to your area. We love you. God bless you. I hope this helps you uh, understand kind of the, the layout. Uh, you will be able to follow along with what we're doing, uh, again, because we will make more information uh, as it becomes available to us. We'll make it available to you. Uh, those regional bishops are working to secure different locations uh, for their region that's large enough to handle all the people. Because as you probably know, in our regions, they're made up of multiple districts which are then made up of multiple churches. So there can be, these could be quite large celebrations. So we hope you'll participate. And we love you guys. And we are thankful to the Lord for the way that he's ministering to so many people. And we're hearing so many good reports of how you guys are, are, are sharing the word and people's, uh, people's lives are being touched. God bless you. And we love you. And we hope to see you soon.